This is Twit. This episode of Tech Break is brought to you by our friends at IT Pro TV, now called ACI Learning. Together, ACI Learning and IT Pro entertain and train your team to keep your business performing at its best. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit. Twit listeners who complete the form can receive as much as 65% off an IT Pro enterprise solution plan. You'll get the proper quote based on the size of your team. So if you are a Tesla owner, perhaps you're not a Tesla owner, you may have heard that uh, a number, <laughs> a large number of Teslas have been recalled. Joining us today to talk about these Tesla recalls is the car guy himself, Sam Abul Samad. Welcome back to the show, Sam. Hey, Micah. Great to be with you again. Great to have you here. So let's get into it. Uh, first and foremost, why has Tesla filed a recall and um, just how many of its vehicles are actually involved in this recall? So the recall is, has to do with the um, hands-on detection and driver monitoring systems on pretty much all of the Teslas that have ever been built, about 2 million uh, vehicles. Um, and that uh, goes back primarily to vehicles built uh, from about 2015 onwards when they started in, uh, using autopilot. Um, and prior to that, Tesla's production volumes were pretty low. So there's probably maybe 50,000, 175,000 cars that aren't affected, but pretty much all the rest of them are affected. Got it. So only the oldest of the old then are the ones that aren't affected? Oh, wait, rather. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So this goes back you know, to before they started building the Model 3 in 2017 and then the Model Y in 2020, when they just had the Model S and the X, which were still relatively low volume uh, vehicles. Does the Cybertruck fall into this? The Cybertruck uh, does fall into this, yes. Interesting. Although, again, there's only a few dozen of those at most right. that are out there. Yeah. Now, this, of course, is a NHTSA investigation that led to the recall. Do we know how long the investigation was going on uh, in regard to this? So this investigation was technically going on for about two years. Um, but in reality, this is something that NHTSA probably should have done back in 2016. Mm. Um, so in May of 2016, there was a crash, was the first known fatal crash involving autopilot, a guy named Joshua Brown. Uh, died in Florida when his Tesla Model S um, drove itself underneath uh, a tractor trailer that was crossing the road that he was uh, that he was driving down, and um, the National Transportation Safety Board launched an investigation at that time. And when they completed their investigation, they made a number of recommendations. So the the way the regulatory system in the U.S. works for for transportation. NTSB is an investigative body. They don't have any regulatory or enforcement power, but they can make recommendations. And then for ground transportation, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is the one that actually sets the rules and regulations. NTSB at that time, and actually it was early 2017, by the time they finished the investigation, made a, a number of really good recommendations that were intended to um, minimize the possibility of driver misuse of the systems. And that's what this all comes down to Got is it. drivers um, using autopilot in ways that it wasn't designed for, uh, such as for driving hands off <laughs> um, or, you know, not paying attention while the system is operating. And among the recommendations that NTSB made back in 2017 were that uh, all vehicles with these types of systems should have, uh, more robust driver monitoring systems to make sure that the driver is always watching the road while using the system and that they have their hands on the wheel. Mm -hmm. uh, and Tesla has never done a very good job of that. Um, they, until relatively recently, they didn't look for the driver watching the road at all. Uh, they only started doing that when they launched the full self-driving beta. Uh, and for hands on the wheel, they use, they use uh, a torque sensor on the steering column that is looking for the motion of the steering wheel. Because when if you think about it, when you drive down the road, there's usually a little bit of motion from your hands. It's Absolutely. usually not keeping your, the steering wheel completely steady. Um, the problem is that's not a very good way of detecting if the driver's hands are actually on the wheel. Uh, what Because I, you can have both false positives and false negatives with it. Okay. If, this, if, it's, um, if it's too strict, 
then you know, if you are actually holding the wheel steady as you're driving down the road, you can have the system constantly warning you, put your hands on the wheel, even when your hands are on the wheel. And I've actually had this happen with a number of Ford vehicles mm. because Ford also uses the same type of approach. They don't use a capacitive sensor in the steering wheel. The, on the opposite side, you can have uh, false positives um, where the system will uh, think your hands are on the wheel because it's easy to fool. Um, you probably, I think you guys have done some stories in the past mm -hmm. about uh, devices that you can buy a little weight that you can hang on the steering wheel, uh, or you can even do it by just shoving a water bottle or an orange in between the steering wheel spokes. And what that does is when auto steers doing little steering corrections, there's just enough weight there to counteract that. So it like, feels okay. like there's some resistance from, from the driver's hands. And so it's, it's just not a very good, uh, solution for detecting hands on the wheel. Um, what other manufacturers like General Motors and Nissan and Volvo and others and Stellantis are doing is putting capacitive sensors in the steering wheel that actually detect when your hands are touching the wheel, which is what you really want. Mm -hmm. um, then the other part of this is eyes watching the road. And again, um, more recent Teslas do have a camera that's mounted up by the rearview mirror, uh, but it's an RGB camera. So it doesn't work well in low light conditions. Uh, it's also very easy to fool. Consumer Reports did some testing last year, I think, uh, where they basically just took a picture of a face and held it up in front of the camera. And, and then, you know, it, it detected that as being somebody watching the road. Um, when in, in fact, what you want is something that can do some depth perception. Uh, so, Again, GM, Ford, um, Nissan, um, many, many others use infrared cameras mounted uh, by the steering column or in the instrument cluster that work very similar to the face ID on your iPhone. Mm -hmm. uh, same, same type of idea that detects where your eyes are looking, your head position, and can also detect, you know, if it's, if your face is three dimensional instead of two dimensional mm -hmm. and works at night, uh, works through polarized sunglasses and can detect if you are actually watching the road. Tesla does none of this. And so as a result, this recall, which all it's doing is pushing out an over the air software update that's supposed to enhance the systems they already have, is probably going to have little or no actual effect. Wow. Okay. Wow. I've got lots of questions from this. So firstly, um, do you think that the fact that Tesla doesn't have these more advanced features for detecting it, is that a selling point for some folks? And then secondarily, or, or it's kind of going on to that, can you even explain to us like what, who is the person and what is their goal in circumventing these systems? Like, is it someone who's literally trying to sleep while they're on the road? Is it just that sort of libertarian, you know, moment of, I just want to be able to see if I can circumvent this? Is it, you know, they want to just, have their hands by their sides because that's like, why are people sticking oranges and water bottles and all this other stuff uh, and holding up photos? I know that was a test, but what's the point of that? Why would you want to be able to just not have your hands there? And then, yeah, is that a kind of a, a secret or subtle selling point of Tesla vehicles that it's a little bit easier to fool that system? Yeah, it's, it's a bit of all of that really. <clears throat> um, you know, back in 2016, when they launched version two of autopilot, you know, after, after the, um, the Joshua Brown crash, the original supplier of the, the, the system of the, the hardware they were using, uh, a company called Mobileye, um, <clears throat> realized that Tesla was misusing the, the system for autopilot. Wow. And they, they had never intended it to be used the way Tesla was using it. And so they stopped supplying their stuff to, to Tesla. So Tesla developed their own in-house system. And during the announcement of that in 2016, Elon Musk, in the, the, the first sentence of the press conference, you can, I'll send you a link, you can find this on, online, the recording of this uh, conference call. Basically, he said that starting this week, all Tesla vehicles have all the, the hardware that they need uh, to uh, be level five autonomous, meaning that they can drive autonomously everywhere. And it's just going to be a matter of updating the software over time. Back in 2016. And, and a lot of Tesla fans 
uh, and investors have bought into this idea that Tesla is going to be able to uh, make their vehicles fully autonomous with nothing more than software updates with the hardware that they have, which is eight cameras, um, one radar sensor, which they actually don't even use the radar sensor anymore, uh, and some some ultrasonic sensors. And so this was, it was never true, but a lot of Tesla fans really bought into this idea. Um, and, you know, there's, there's people, you know, that are, that are in the, the tech industry that, oh, that are, you know, think, oh yeah, let's, let's see what this can really do. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're trying to push it to its limits. And, you know, Musk has done nothing to dissuade people from this idea. Uh, even though when you want, when you first, uh, start the system in the the in the usual end user license agreement. It says, you know, driver is fully responsible. You got to keep your hands on the road, eye, hands on the wheel, eyes on the road. But they don't really, they've never really done anything to enforce that, mm-hmm. uh, whereas other manufacturers do. And so there are some Tesla fans that that do misuse the system. Got it. Now uh, I know that earlier this year uh, there was a recall for Tesla vehicles. Was that kind of the the first portion of this? That was the FSD beta software that NHTSA said was not working properly. How does that relate that to was, this? That was a different one. Okay. Um, that one, uh, if I, let's see, if I recall correctly, that, yeah, that one had to do with in the, um, the FSD beta software. So FSD is the full self-driving system, which is not actually fully self-driving. <laughs> that's a whole other discussion. Um, but one of the things that Tesla had programmed it to do was sometimes it would roll through stop signs. And it wouldn't, instead of coming to a complete stop, and there were some other, a few other things like that that were not technically, you know, following the rules of the road. And NHTSA required them to, to push out an update to change that. Got it. Now, you said it was pro- programmed. Does that mean it was quite literally programmed in the si- as opposed to it just being something that happened by accident? They said, no, roll through stop signs like you live yes. in California. That is wild to me. I didn't realize that it was that. Yeah, it's, the, the idea is they were, they were trying to make it behave the way human drivers do. Right, right. And there's some things that human drivers do that you probably don't want to replicate with an, <laughs> with an uh, software. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm from Missouri, and so I call it the California stop because everybody yes. has come around here, they all just roll their stop signs all the time. I do not. Uh, so I guess I'm, I'm more like NHTSA in that way. Um, now, I feel like this technology has been under scrutiny for a number of reasons, being that it's not full self-driving and uh, the claims were made early on. And then now this issue, I just am curious, you as someone who's watched this and knows about the technology, were you even surprised to see this recall come around and to see this many vehicles, basically all Teslas be recalled? Did it shock you? Uh, yeah, frankly, given this is uh, complete lack of real action and, and, you know, taking responsibility over the last what, seven years now, um, I'm kind of surprised that they that they even bothered. Um, so, you know, to, to the degree that they did anything at all, I'm glad they did that, um, you know, and, you know, considering how long it's been that they could have, you know, if they had taken action back in 2017 when NHTSA or when the NTSB made those recommendations, that would have been prior to the launch of the Model 3. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the Model 3 and then the, the beginning of the Model Y production in 2020, that represents the vast majority of all of Tesla's production ever. You know, the, the Model S and the Model X have always been relatively low volume cars, but the, the 3 and the Y are the ones that they sell in high volumes. And if they had taken action before the Model 3 went into production, and required Tesla to make some real substantive changes back then, then there wouldn't have been a, a, a recall of 2 million vehicles now. There might have been a recall of probably uh, fifty or 60,000 vehicles at most. Got it. Got it. Um, you, you briefly touched on this kind of throughout. I'd love it if you uh, summed this up. There are a number of vehicle manufacturers that have autopilot-like systems in their vehicles. So how does Tesla's technology compare is it more advanced? Is it less advanced? And again, you kind of touched on it. Some of them seem to have more security measures in place than others. Is that a matter of it coming from sort of old school car manufacturers or wh- where does that come in? 
Yeah, so um, General Motors was one of the first to, to launch a, a system like this, their Super Cruise system, which came out in, originally in 2017. Uh, Ford has Blue Cruise that they have on a number of models now. Uh, it's been out for a couple of years. Uh, Nissan's ProPilot version 2. Uh, BMW has a system like this, Mercedes-Benz. Uh, and there are others that are coming to market over the next year or two that are actually hands-free driving systems. They're designed to be operated hands-free. Uh, so you, when you're, but the thing that they do is they geofence them. So they, it. it's only, you can only activate the hands-free component when you're on certain roads, uh, mostly on divided highways, uh, limited access highways, uh, where there's not a lot of intersections or no intersections. You don't have pedestrians to deal with, uh, things like that. Uh, so they, they use maps to geofence the systems, uh, and they also use, uh, more robust, um, driver monitoring systems for the eye gaze, head position and, um, hand, hands on the wheel. Um, Tesla is the only, Tesla is the only one that, um, well, there are others like the first generation Nissan ProPilot system that are nominally similar similar to Tesla or um, uh, Hyundai's Highway Drive Assist that um, allow hands-on lane centering and, and sort of the auto steer functionality. But uh, even those, um, while they they tip while they typically don't have um, a uh, steering uh, capacitor sensor in the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. um, they have, they typically have a shorter timeout um, when it, you know, with usually within about uh, 10 seconds or so, if it thinks that the driver's hands aren't on the steering wheel, that it'll tell you to put your hands on the wheel. Tesla, uh, a lot of times will, the system can go minutes without alerting the driver to put their hands on the wheel. Wow. And Tesla has never geofenced their system in any way to limit where you can enable it. Even though they tell you to only use it on highways, there's nothing to stop you from using it in the city or anywhere else. So, you know, as an engineer, one of the things that I always uh, learned early on in my career mm -hmm. and that, that we always practiced was, you know, and I worked on safety systems like traction control and electronic stability control was to try to anticipate the ways that drivers could misuse the system. And then put in whatever you could to try to mitigate that, to try to minimize the impact of that, to try and detect that. Tesla has never done that. They've said, yeah, the driver's responsible, you know, let them do what they want. Mm -hmm. And and that's, you know, I think uh, a reckless and, and irresponsible way to do this. Mm, yeah, it's it seems vastly different from what all of these other manufacturers are doing, where there is yeah. concern there at the very least. And this just seems like, eh, let them figure it out. Um, lastly, I'll just ask, uh, what will Tesla owners need to do to uh, address the recall? They, they, I imagine they don't need to go into some Tesla dealer to to get a new piece or something. It's, it's uh, much simpler than that. Yeah, uh, basically, they don't have to do anything, uh, which is one of the nice things about over the air updates is uh, Tesla will push out the, the update software um, either over Wi-Fi or a cellular connection to the phone or to, to the car. And um, when the car is parked, uh, it will do the update. It'll run the, the software update. And the next time you get in the car, it'll flash up on the screen and say, hey, you know, you got a software update. You know, here's here's the change notes um, and be on your way. So there's nothing that the customers have to do. Um, and because they're not being required to do any hardware changes, that's that's it. So uh, they they should all all pretty much all Tesla owners should be getting the update within the next day or so. Wonderful. All right. Well, Sam, uh, it is always a pleasure to get to chat with you. I always end up learning something more than I even thought I was going to. Um, if folks want to follow you online and stay up to date with everything that you're doing, where should they go to do so? Uh, let's see, you can find me at my day job as a principal analyst at Guidehouse Insights, guidehouseinsights.com. Uh, you can check out uh, the Wheel Bearings podcast at wheelbearings.media. And I do that with uh, my friends Roberto Baldwin and Nicole uh, Wakelin uh, every week. Um, and um, and you can find me on uh, um, Mastodon and um, Threads and Blue Sky as well. Just look for my name. Awesome. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Have a great day, Micah. 